Hi, my name is Christo Free, audiologist and author of the Hearing Aid Buyer's Guide for the Self-Funded Australian. Today, I'd like to speak to you about what to expect during a comprehensive hearing assessment. There are many kinds of hearing tests available. Some are free, some are paid for, some are really brief, really just a check to see whether or not you have hearing loss. You have diagnostic assessment, which is typically referred by a doctor to be done to collect diagnostic information for medical purposes. Then you've got hearing aid assessments. Again, they could be very brief, they could be very long, or anywhere in between. Really what I want to discuss today is what to expect during a hearing aid assessment. So a test where you go to see whether or not you are a suitable candidate for a hearing aid and also to find out whether a hearing aid will work and if so, which hearing aid. All hearing assessments typically start with a case history. The case history is an opportunity for you and the audiologist to build a bit of a relationship and it's an opportunity for the clinician to ask you about your hearing history in particularly medical issues which might relate to your hearing loss, noise exposure, family history, any ongoing concerns you have with your hearing, and also to see where your hearing loss, if any, affects you greatest. We also go into things like whether you have any ringing in your ears, any balance issues, or anything else we need to be aware of. Case history can run anywhere between five and 10 minutes. Typically, once the case history is completed, the audiologist will have a look in your ears. That's a very important part because we want to make sure there's no wax or infection or any other obstructions blocking the sound getting in your ear. If there are any, the audiologist might attempt to remove the, the wax or obstruction or if it's too impacted, then the audiologist may refer you away to get that cleared first. So it's always a good idea to have someone check your ears before you go for the test. That will just save the disappointment when you've got to go away and come back again. Once the audiologist or clinician has had a look in your ears and are happy with what they've seen, they'll typically put some earphones on you. That might be in a booth or it might be in the room if the room's a quiet environment. It's typically calibrated for that environment. You'll wear some earphones which are either over the ear or go in the ear and you'll be required to listen out for fine little beeps. With each beep, you just need to press the button the moment you hear the beep, even if it's really, really faint. So even at that point where you think you're hearing it, still press. The audiologist will tell you if you press a little bit too much. Each ear is tested individually at different pitches and different volumes to see where the damage is in the ear. Another test you may undergo during that same assessment is a speech and choir test. A speech and choir test is really a test where we evaluate your ability to hear speech once we've corrected for your hearing loss. A speech inquired test consists out of a number of short English words played through a calibrated system, which you simply need to repeat. It might start very soft and the volume's ramped up until we find the level at where you hear the best for speech inquired. Another test which is rarely used but very important is a speech and noise test to really compare your ability to hear speech and noise to that of a normal hearing person. And the speech and noise test also helps us identify which hearing aid might work for you. I've got another video that goes into that particular test in a lot more detail because it's quite a critical part. The audiologist may also do what we call a bone conduction test where they put a tiny little vibrator behind your ear. All that does, it conducts the sound through your skull like these modern type of headphones you can see around the place. So rather than going through the ear, the sound travels through the skull going straight to the nerve so we can basically see by testing through the skull how that compares when we test through the ear and find any blockages we may have missed earlier. The audiologist may also choose, if needed, to do what we call a tympanogram where they simply put a little probe in your ear and they check the pressure in the middle ear that may show up any ear infections or blockages of the station tube or any other conditions which might need medical attention. Once that whole process has been completed, the audiologist will go through and discuss your results with you. When I explain the hearing loss, I start off by just showing my clients a short video, runs for about a minute, explaining normal hearing. So it's important to understand what normal is so that you can reference what we found during the hearing test and see where you fit in relative to the normal hearing. Once you understand what normal hearing looks like, we can explain what we found during the, the hearing assessment. When we look at the ear, we consider that there's three main parts that might be involved in hearing loss. Each part might contribute completely or in part to hearing loss, but the treatment options for each part is different, so we need to identify which parts which. So we start off just looking at the outer ear, which is the bit you can see by looking at or in the ear. 
and that ends at the eardrum. Following that we've got the middle ear space which is this air filled space here and that connects to the outside world via the eustachian tube, a little tube opening at the back of your throat or nose and that's the tube that pops when we go up and down hills. The middle ear also has the three little hearing bones which transfer sounds from the ear canal through to the inner ear. The inner ear is a fluid filled structure and that's essentially where sound energy is converted to electrical energy before it's sent up to the brain for interpretation. We simply start by looking in the ear as we did and normally we can see the eardrum. We may also be able to see the bone attached to the back of the eardrum called the malleus which then normally gives us this view here. We can see the eardrum there and we can also see the bone attached to the back of the eardrum. Normally we'll see a nice bright reflection here which is the tightest part of the ear but what we're looking for any sort of fluid levels or bubbles or tears or anything odd going on there. But in your case everything looked clear. So the only thing we know by the time we put on the earphone is whether or not sounds reaching the eardrum. If we can see the eardrum we know sounds getting through as well. We still don't know if we detect a hearing loss through the earphone alone, whether that problem is in the middle ear or whether it's in the nerve because we're testing the whole system at once. That's why we put the little vibrator behind your head and that vibrates the whole skull bringing the fluid in the inner ear into motion and we can then compare notes. So if you did better through the skull than that you did through the ear, we know the middle ear is also involved. However, in your case, it didn't matter which way we tested, we got the same result, which shows that the cochlea, the inner ear, is involved, which is a sensory neural hearing loss, the most common type of hearing loss we actually deal with. How it works, as you've seen before, sound comes through, hits the eardrum, vibrates these three little bones attached to the eardrum and those vibrations get passed through to this last little bone called the stapes of stirrup. It sits on a little membrane pumping the membrane a bit like a piston and that creates wave-like actions or motions in the fluid that fills the inner ear. That wave originates here and travels all the way along and finally exits through a little pressure tube here, releasing the pressure. The cochlea, the snail structure, is arranged a bit like a piano. We call it tonotopically arranged. So it responds to very high pitched sounds here at the entrance and as we move up towards the apex or tip, the pitch gets lower and lower and lower down to the deepest basis sound we can hear at the top there. For instance, an alarm tone which physically sits there would stimulate the cochlea at that point. That's about 3000 hertz. So the reason noise, which is in your case seems to be the biggest issue, affects high pitch more than low pitch. It's not because these little hairs are tight or anything like that. It's simply the arrangement of the hair cells containing high pitch here and low pitch there. So any way of coming through here, whether it's a low pitch or high pitch sound starts here and a bit like a hose pointing towards a corner on soil, it washes out that corner. So we find most of the damage is in the high pitch here and then as the wave travels it loses energy. So most of noise damage actually occurs in the high pitch first and that's why we see a high pitch dip. And if we do a cross section there, we can actually see the little hairs associated with that particular pitch or frequency. So if the right sound comes through it vibrates creating a nice big wave at that point called resonance frequency. It bends these little hair cells over and to simplify things it basically triggers a little chemical trigger which causes the nerve attached to these hair cells to fire and based on which nerve was actually triggered your brain knows what you heard and there's about 30,000 of these little hairs inside the cochlea. So when we look at it we're looking up the tube there we can see the hair cells arranged if they're nice and healthy they're upright like this sound comes through bends them over and you hear. However in your case you also have hair cells looking like this. So the area of damage around that snail shell relates to the pitch of the loss and the amount of hair cell damage relates to the severity of the loss. That's why we look at the different sounds you can hear at the different pitches. That first beep test you listen to, we had to press when you hear the beep. That's what we were looking for, where the damage is in the cochlea. So by doing that, we got what we call an audiogram, which is this graph here. On the audiogram, what we can see are some blue and red graphs. For us, blue is always left red is right, the crosses is how you heard through the earphone for the left ear, the circles is how you heard through this earphone for the right ear 
and the little brackets is where we test it through the skull. What you can see is your left ear equals more or less your right ear, which is typical. We, we start worrying a little bit if things start drifting apart. Normally they'd be fairly equal or close to each other. We test it from low pitch or bass on the left side of the graph through to high pitch or treble on the right side of the graph. And then you can see here where I've indicated normal, mild, moderate, through to profound hearing loss. So the further down the graph was made, the worse your hearing was for that particular point. So a normal hearing graph would all fall within this light gray area here. As you can see, your low pitch hearing, which is your bass hearing, is closer to normal than your high pitch hearing. What that tells me is that you can hear the low pitch, which relates to your vowels, and particularly volume of voice is fairly normal. So you might feel you hear things equally loud to anyone else but your problem really relates to clarity, which is more the high pitch. If you had a low pitch loss, you'd find your volumes affected, but the clarity maybe not as much. So what I've done there is I've just cleaned it up a bit and I've grayed out the area where you can't hear. So as you can see, further down is worse. What you can see there are the different speech sounds at the level they'll reach your ear. If someone spoke to you about two meters away without looking at you. I'm saying without looking at you, because as soon as you look at someone, you get another 40 to 50% off the lips. Whether you train or not, it just happens. It's not, not a skill you need to train, although if you train it, you can get a little bit better. We can see here that all the sounds in the white, which are basically the vowels and the, the, the voice sounds, you can hear. So you can essentially hear who's talking, how loudly they're talking more or less, but you cannot hear the consonants. So you cannot clearly hear what's being said. So in your case, it might feel like everyone's mumbling. There might also be a difference between early in the morning or later in the afternoon because this kind of hearing loss takes a lot of effort to, to listen through. So when you're feeling, feeling tired or less well, you might find your hearing's not quite as good. We can essentially calculate the percentage of speech sounds you're missing out on if you're not looking at someone. So in your case, you're only getting about between 17 and 24% of the speech correct if someone spoke to you without looking at you. So there'd be a lot of times when you're looking away from someone and you just can't make out what they're saying. You'd also find that rapid speech might be problematic because your brain can't just use sound, which is really quick. You'll need to sort of work out what the word was or what the context was, what were we talking about to fill in the gaps. And while you're still figuring out the first sentence, the person may be onto the second or third sentence and you've missed the whole message. The question then was, if this is the loss, which we know is, is fairly significant, how much benefit can we actually get through amplification? And that's where the speech testing quiet came in. So that's where we essentially played you the short little words, made things loud enough for you to hear properly, and you had to repeat those words. So there was no context for you to try and guess what the word was. In your case, as soon as we made things loud enough, in your right ear, you got 100% correct. In your left ear, you got 97% correct. So we know the brain's ready and waiting, it's just the ear, which works like the microphone to the brain, that's not delivering the sound appropriately. So we know you can do a lot better and quiet. However, all it takes is a little bit of background noise and things change. Something like someone turning on a radio or a couple of people walking into the room and each person has a different ability to hear in noise. So in your case, what we did is we played you those sentences. Every sentence had a little bit of more background noise and you had to repeat those sentences. And we essentially found out where you started having trouble. In your case, you needed the speech to be about eight times louder than the background noise. Where a normal ear can normally hear when speech and noise is more or less equal. So why that's important is because each hearing aid has different capability to reduce background noise. The very best hearing aids can do almost double that amount of improvement in background noise. So in your case, we know we don't need the best, we need something more in the middle. Knowing how well you can hear speech and noise, we can identify the exact hearing aid that you need. The graph that we can see on here will also help us determine what kind of hearing aid we want. So essentially, we don't want to add too much of the low pitch because that will make things quite boomy, might make you feel blocked off. So basically, we use your audiogram, which is the graph, alongside with observations of your ear size and shape and health as to what style of hearing aid we need. Then we use your speech and quiet information to get an estimation of how well you might do when we boost things in quiet. And we use the speech and noise hearing test to determine how much the hearing aid needs to help you in background noise, which helps us find the exact level of hearing aid you need. So combining all that information, we can pinpoint the exact hearing aid that you, you might require and the first best option to look at. If you like what you see and you'd like to see more of these sort of videos, click on the subscribe button. 
I'll leave some articles and links in the comment section. Feel free and, and please reply with comments in that section as well or on any of our videos. So until later, take care.